solutions to the dropout crisis, addressing the dropout crisis one strategy at a time. Brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center Network with support from K-12 and in partnership with Clemson Broadcast Productions. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to our special summer edition of Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. We hope you're enjoying your summer, but had a kind of an interest in seeing what's going on in the education world. And you know, we have once again uh, been collecting some of the great uh, interviews that we collected at the conferences this past year in both Myrtle Beach and Oklahoma City. So Karen, here we go again. We're going to have some fun today uh, meeting some new people. We are, Marty, and I'm glad to be here. It, it's kind of a fun theme this time. I think y'all picked a great theme, and that's kind of future-oriented. Looking, here we are in the 21st century. <laughs> well, we better live like we're and learn why we are in the 21st century. So today's segments really look, do three interesting things. One is looking at what we're doing in schools today to prepare students for this future world they're going to be living in and we need to be addressing that. So our first presenter talks about that. Secondly, we're looking at some very, I think, futuristic technology that's being used today to help students. And then finally, the third thing is looking at our dear friends, the College of uh, Education here at Clemson University, and how they are preparing teachers for the and leaders for this 21st century. So future, here we come. We want to be ready. We run, and that's part of dropout prevention, isn't it, Karen? Right, right. We need to think about the future and what we're doing uh, to lead students in the right direction. And engage them and so they see you know, mm -hmm. why we want to learn these mm -hmm. things. So um, as always, on the website, we have things to help uh, follow up uh, discussion-wise. And I think this one might generate some interesting discussion. So we have the discussion board, as always, right. but what you else do we have? can log in, make comments on that discussion board uh, right on the web page for mm -hmm. this broadcast. Okay. Um, we also have a Twitter account if you uh, would like to tweet anything to us on, a to on this topic or anything else at, at NDPCN. Mm -hmm. We have a Facebook page as well. That's right. It's fine. And uh, mm -hmm. we can have a conversation that way. So we'd love to have a continuing conversation on this uh, looking toward the future in the 21st century and and what we're doing to make sure we're supporting the students and teachers. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to know if others would share some of the things they're doing as they look to that 21st that would be century. Fantastic. Yes. So um, I think we started um, uh, this conversation in Oklahoma City. We did. Um, earlier this year, we were in Oklahoma City at the uh, National Dropout Prevention Center's Native Students and Tribal Communities Conference, and I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Franklin Shargell from uh, Shargell Consulting Group about the what a 21st century classroom looks like, what are some of the skills that need to be taught to the students so they're prepared for, prepared for a 21st century workplace, and um, how does that relate to a, the global economy? Um, so on the way to the taping of this uh, broadcast, I ran into Michael Lillywhite, who was there from Skillbot, and uh, they, a Skillbot, uh, develops software for, uh, that helps with skills, um, uh, assessments of skills. Students can take the skills assessments mm -hmm. through Skillbot. Anyway, I asked him if he would join me as a co-host, and he was gracious enough to do that. So uh, we're going to hear now from Franklin Shargell and co-host Michael Lillywhite, and let's see now what they had to say about the 21st century workplace. I'd like to talk about not schools today, but the schools and the economy tomorrow. Um, Toyota is recognized as no longer being simply a Japanese car company. It's a global company. Coca-Cola is a global company. It's not solely an American company. Schools need to be as globally competitive as businesses are. Um, schools around the world need to be globally competitive. The Chinese in Singapore 
and uh, the Koreans and, and the Indians are now focusing on improving education as one of the driving forces for their economy. So the best graduates in my city in Albuquerque are not competing for jobs with the best graduates at, in Clemson, South Carolina, mm -hmm. but the best graduates in the, world. in the world. And we need to recognize that. So how do we determine a country's wealth? Well, in the 15th and 16th country, century, it was the country with the most gold. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the Western world was discovered, because we sent explorers out. By the 17th through the 19th century, it was the co country with the most colonies. And so England became the, the world leader. And then through the 20th century, it was the country with the greatest industrial production. It's one of the reasons, of course, America won the Second World War and, and even in the First World War. In the 21st century, the century we're currently living in, what's going to drive? What does the best country in the world look like? And in my opinion, it's the country with the best schools. And we have no better example, as I've mentioned, than China and India focusing their attention not only to improving their economy, but improving their economy through in the improvement. Uh, so the question that this session hopefully will answer is what does a world-class school look like? And how do we prepare our schools in this country to be world-class schools? What skills and aptitudes do world-class schools need to teach? And what does a world-class school teacher and school administrator look like? And we're really talking about an investment. Yes. An investment in people. And an invest, and yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we have to look far out. We cannot be short term. Mm -hmm. Right, long term uh, investment. It's, it's got to be a long term investment. And we keep on hearing that America's schools are not doing very well. Well, I, in my travels and presenting world uh, workshops, that's not true. Our schools are improving, and we need to acknowledge that. The problem is they're not improving as quickly as society and the workplace need. There are lots of jobs. Pick up any local newspaper, you'll see lots of jobs advertised in, in those newspapers. However, we don't have people who can fill those positions. They haven't been trained for that. And that's one of the reasons why we are importing immigrants into the United States in order to take those jobs. Mm -hmm. So I keep on hearing wherever I go that education is very expensive. In my state of New Mexico, it takes up over 50% mm -hmm. of, but it is- Labor a, intensive. Right. Sure. Education isn't expensive. Ignorance is very expensive. True. Yeah. And education is the solution to most of the world's and of course America's problem. You want to uh, eliminate poverty? Educate. You want to eliminate incarceration? Educate. You want to eliminate uh, uh, welfare, social services? Educate. Education is really the solution to the problem. And we need to recognize that when we look at the, the, at the pictures on the graph, you'll see that there is a major decrease in the, in the past 100 years, actually in the past 50 years, of a decrease in the unskilled population. Mm -hmm. uh, McDonald's now has opened in its headquarters in Illinois uh, the next generation of, of uh, McDonald's, where people will, we, we, there are three people working a shift mm -hmm. you're not going to have. And they need to know computer skills. Right. And, <laughs> and to, to fix work. an automobile, there are computers on board. Mm -hmm. We need to have computer skills. And right now, if you go into, t into any supermarket in the United States, you are the one entering the pricing. And you're even doing the begging. We're laying off people in low-skilled jobs. So low-skilled jobs are going to disappear as they are now. And Franklin, they need to be multi-skilled as well. Right. Able to work that computer but interface with the customer and, and do everything because right. there are fewer and fewer workers for the jobs. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I love this quote. Uh, it comes from Warren Dennis, who is an expert on on uh, workforce employment, 
And Warren Bennis has said, the factory of the future is going to employ two, two, two individuals, a, a man and his dog. <laughs> the job of the man uh, the, is to feed the dog. The job of the dog is to keep the man away from the machinery. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and we have seen that mm. there has been a decrease in manufacturing mm -hmm. in this country. If you look at the clothing you're mm -hmm. wearing, you'll see foreign labels. Do you know we no longer manufacture glass frames in the United States? I mean, we've got to come aware that we're living in a global society. Sure. So I'm not going to read this slide, but we need to cr create graduates who are systems thinkers who are problem solvers, who know how to work on teams, mm -hmm. um, who are lifelong learners. Uh, mm -hmm. um, as I said in an earlier workshop, we're using the wrong name for completion of school. It's not graduation. It should be commencement. It's not the end of the road. Sure. It's the beginning of the next phase of life, whether you graduate from high school and go into the mm -hmm. world of work, or whether you grow, graduate high school and go into college, which prepares you for another phase and another way. Uh, so again, the audience can read the slides. So, so you've, got, you've got love of learning. Right. You also need to have skills for the jobs that are right. there, and you also need to be able to maneuver through life and relationships and things that you have to have in, right. to be a to I think it's a good successful. balance between the hard skills and the soft skills. Mm -hmm. Good point, good point. So I've been through the Hyundai factory in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and they're not training their people to do one job. They are expected to learn how to fix, to, to control the entire manufacturing process. We have a divide. We have what I call gaps. Uh, we have a gap, a skills gap, which generally isn't being talked about. We have sure. a, a computer gap. We have a have and a have not population. We have a have population with information skills, and we have a have not population with the industrial age skills. And that's based on testing. It's rote regurgitation and memorization. That doesn't function any longer because people who get hired in industry, and again, representing ASQ, people who get hired in industry are expected to solve the problems they face. And rote regurgitation and memorization will no longer work. Right. True. And, and <laughs> I agree. Wholeheartedly. <laughs> <Here, here. laughs> And Alvin Toffler has said that the illiterate of the future will not be the pe people who can't read, but it will be the person that doesn't know how to think. Alvin Toffler, to, rem to remind people, wrote the book called Future Shock. That the future is coming very quickly. In fact, we're living in the future. If I point to uh, uh, an issue 20 seconds from now, that's the future. And then in 20 seconds, it's the past. We've got to prepare not for the present, but for the future. And Albert Einstein says, what we're focusing on is improving and solving problems. And he said, very pointedly, the problems we face today cannot be solved at the same skill level that created those problems. We need to think about how do we solve the problems of the, of the future generation. And so I've developed this, I call it more and less. We need more experimental hands-on learning, which is one of the 15 strategies that the center and I help to put together. Uh, Young people love to do something real right, right there, you know, not and, abstract. And your curriculum focuses on hands-on learning. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, we need active learning, which again is part of it. We need uh, to look at and benchmark countries like Finland which and, and Europe, which has fewer subjects but taught in greater depth. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a choice for students. We need to give students a choice of what books they read instead of insisting. And I asked at my workshop, uh, 
how many of you think children don't like to read? And I got a lot of hands up. And I said, then explain to me the success of Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Those are thick books, exactly. too. <laughs> yes, they like to read books that they want to read. And then I asked the audience, of course, uh, how many of you have read the instruction manual for the 1040 income tax form? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, good point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> adults yes. like children want to choose what they want to read. And I'm not saying eliminate. Just give them a choice mm -hmm. on what they want to read. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to move on to the next slide. Um, we believe especially, and I'm a former high school person, high school teacher and, and high school school administrator, the worker in school it should not be the teacher. The worker in school should be the student. I sat, and I'm sure much of your audience has sat in teacher lounges and teacher cafeterias and heard the teacher say, I really worked hard today, and they didn't do anything. We've taken away the responsibility for learning from children. We need to give it back to them. We need to have, um, we need to understand, uh, we had people running for president uh, who said children need to be prepared for schools. And yes, that's true, but schools need to be prepared for the diverse children that are presently coming into schools. So it's, it, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not just one end. Um, well, you learn so much from working hard, and then you know there's a great pride of accomplishment. Right. Yeah. We need individual learning. Again, one of the 15 strategies. We need learning that's individualized to meet the needs of the children. Uh, uh, we need uh, less thinking about, again, we're teaching children not how to think, which is a 21st century skill, but what to think, that there's only one answer on a test. And I, what I call teacher questions. I have the answer, you have to guess what the right answer is. <laughs> um, students have gotta be up, active, uh, less time reading textbooks, uh, and less attempts by teachers to cover large amounts of material. Um, Less, uh, less rote memorization. But let's skip to the, what is a teacher? What does a world-class teacher look like? They have to be friendly. Teachers are missionaries. They are really have to love children. When I hired people to work for me, the first question I asked is, you gotta convince me you love kids. Because if you don't love kids, you don't belong in a classroom. You definitely don't belong in a school that I'm working in, yeah. or you know. Yeah. Sure. And, yeah. and that's the first requirement. Not what school college did you graduate from or what was your GPA or what was the last book. That's mm -hmm. important. I'm not diminishing that. We've been hearing that here at the conference yeah. uh, that we're, where we are talking about that's so important for relationships. Yes. Is when you know someone cares for you. Right. You know, it starts with love and care for, for the other person. Making that connection. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And Bill Daggett, uh, uh, formerly from New York State, Department of Education has said there are three essential components in education. Uh, rigor, uh, oh, <laughs> terrific. Rigor, relationships, and uh, relevance. relevance. Relevance, yeah. And he said, uh, and I talk about the fact that no child has ever risen to low expectations. Mm -hmm. You have to raise expectations for all children. Not every child is going to reach them, but at least he sure. said, but of rigor, relevance, and relationships, the most important is establishing relationships. And that's one of, you know, they have to be interested in students. They have to be sensitive to the needs of the children. Um, and then they have to be fair. They have to defend the weak. Uh, I'm do I did a session on bullying, um, a, a mm -hmm. growing problem in our country, a growing problem in the world. Sure. They have to be in the position of once they have established that a child is being bullied, they have to take it as a serious. Imagining it's their own child that's being bullied because mm. uh, I said, uh, when I sent teachers into the classroom for the first time, I sent, said to teachers, treat every child as if they're your child because they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're so, our children. Yes, they're our children, it's not just 
they have to differentiate their, their learning. Uh, this is a non. Uh, and and this comes from the uh, workforce on on America's skills. And since I believe the audience knows how to read, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to turn it over. How does your curriculum, how does your fit into what, what I've just said? Well, I, <coughs> excuse me, I think it fits in in a, in a wide variety of ways. Um, <coughs> you know, there's the academic element, there's the uh, hard skill element. And I think one of the big missing links is the soft skills, the 21st century skills, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Karen, and, and, and the importance that they play in preparing today's students for success in the workplace. Um, if you look historically in the last several years, you know, going back several years, how students communicate, you know, they, they don't make eye contact mm -hmm. anymore. They don't know how to shake your hand. They've lost, you know, some of those uh, critical skills that employers look for, and that are required today and in the future for success in the workplace. So that's our primary focus: is to provide a comprehensive, in-depth curriculum that goes hand in hand with the academics, that helps educators help their students learn those essential skills mm -hmm. they need for success in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And you've identified those career-ready skills. Yes, there are 75 different skills that range from communication, interpersonal, uh, how to write a resume, how to deal with ambiguity. So we not only focus on helping them with their own personal communication and interpersonal skills, we teach them the skills they need to go out and productively search and seek and, and, and obtain employment. And then we take it even a step further, is we show them the skills they need to succeed on the job. How do you be part of a team? How do you create value within your company? How do you deal with ambiguity? And a, a wide range. We have over 160 hours of online standards-based 21st century curriculum to help educators meet those goals for their mm -hmm. students. And, and you, ha you also start at different levels too, right? You have yes. adult ed, you have, you have down to Absolutely. Um, it, it's okay. not just uh, middle school, high school, and college. It's uh, we're in adult ed centers, we're in correctional mm -hmm. facilities to help reduce recidivism. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, virtually every 13 to 30 year old can benefit, mm -hmm. you know, from our curriculum in some way, yeah. shape, or form. Responding to a need out sure. there because mm -hmm. you can't just be, you can't just have the skills to 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 do your job. You've got, I mean, well, you have to have the skills to do your job is the bottom line. But your job involves more than just a real specialization in one particular thing. Sure. You've got to kind of have everything now. Well, like we were talking about just a little earlier about, you know, what, what the key goal, you know, is in the country. It's to increase economic development. Mm -hmm. And the number one way to do that is with a skilled workforce. And we talked a little bit about the Harvard Graduate School of Education's uh, study they released in 2011 called Pathways to Prosperity. Essentially, it said two things. One is, no longer can you have two different career paths, academic hard skills, without teaching the 21st century right. skills as well. And they also predict that by 2018, there's going to be 43 million new jobs in the United States, of which only 13 million of those are going to require some kind of college degree or technical degree. So that leaves 30 million jobs for high school graduates. They're going to be available as they exit, you know, their high school with their high school degree and, mm -hmm. and so on. So, so it's important that we think about that and make sure that we're preparing them on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Right. And and the world is constantly changing. Yes, sir. So that that the jobs they're Absolutely. going to need in the 21st century, like 10 years from now, will be different than the current ones that we have. Um, John Akers, who was the former chief executive of, of IBM, said he got it, and businesses are getting it, that education isn't a social concern. It's a major economic issue, just to fit into what you've just said. If students can't compete today, how will our companies compete tomorrow? And I think that's part of the keys of what we're dealing with. Um, and again, just to quote, recognized experts, uh, the chief, former chief executive officer of U.S. West and 
the co-chair of the business partnership of the Education Commission of the States. At this rate, we're not going to have America's labor force. We'll simply not have the skills necessary to make us competitive in the world global marketplace by the year 2000. The quality of our schools determines the quality of our workforce. For too many young people, they leave skill, school untrained and unskilled. So we have got to change that, and one of my favorite economists, Lester Thoreau, wrote, in the 21st century, the education and skills of the workforce will end up being the competitive dominant workforce. And, and of course, I think this is a culminating slide, and it basically says, no country has succeeded without educating its people. Education is the key to sustained growth and the reduction of poverty. We need to focus on that slide for our current school population. We're not preparing children for today's world, but for tomorrow's world. And tomorrow's world is the world of work. So even if the children of today take a, a way stop going through college, college is not the end. College is simply a preparation for a different way of life. So there's a global recognition, and uh, the former president of the World Bank has, has as you see, has made the, that statement. Um, so there's a global recognition that it's not just in America do we need to produce better skilled people, but it's a global effort to produce better workforce skilled people. Right. And again, coming back, that's one of the 15 strategies. That is how, and, and, and young people realize that. And I think everybody should go back and look at those things that you, we mentioned about what does the classroom look like mm -hmm. to produce those 21st century skills? What do the teachers look like? And what kind of graduates are you looking for who can compete and be successful after graduation? So thank you both so much for coming. Thank you, thank you Franklin. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, Karen. You. Appreciate it. Franklin, thank nice you. Meeting you. Nice meeting you too. You know, it's always interesting listening to Franklin Shargal. Uh, he is such a future-oriented person. It's just terrific. And this whole thing about measuring a country uh, over the d centuries, you know, by gold or by industries, and nowadays by education. And we are in a global world, and education for that global economy is so important. And Marty, also, um, as you know, one of the 15 effective mm -hmm. strategies for dropout prevention is career and technical education. And when students and the, the curriculum is aligned with opportunities after school, uh, post, for post graduation, and students realize that uh, relevancy of the curriculum and the, um, that they are actually getting skills for the 21st century workforce, our workplace, um, you know, that can be a real motivating uh, reason to stay in school and a real motivator. And a lot of times those real world kind of classes are actually the most interesting ones for students when you bring in those real world connections. And absolutely, and there's a really, uh, we got a segue here now to what's coming next in our next segment, because it's a really, 21st century way to bring the real world into classrooms all over this country. It's quite a trick. Yes, yes. Yes, it is. And I want you to kind of introduce our next gentleman because okay. he's got quite a story to tell us. So our next segment, we talked with Stuart Rodehaver. Uh, Sandy Addis, Dr. Sandy Addis, talked with him in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at the uh, National Forum for At-Risk Students. And um, Stuart is the CEO of Visitech USA. And uh, the Visitech has this really awesome software that can, students can use to really see things in 3D. Uh, the objects are right before them. They can take things apart, they can put them back together, they can go inside engines, the human heart, <laughs> <laughs> everything wow. like that. Dr. Addis talked to him in Myrtle Beach and um, interviewed him about this cutting edge 3D software and the applications of that. Stuart, you've, you've had an interesting career path. You have transitioned <laughs> from being a, a commanding general in multiple war zones to the leader of, of a high-tech uh, instructional technology 
development company. Tell us how that happened. Well, it, it, uh, my first is I really believe that people ought to be able to reinvent themselves every now and then. And uh, I, through the last few years of my career, I was commanding troops in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and different areas where we felt like they weren't really trained to the level we wanted them to be trained at. So we started looking for a better way to train them. And we developed a new technology in virtual reality, augmented reality, and interactive 3D that we were able to increase the retention rate, uh, increase the critical path thinking skills, and increase test scores by over 33% for our students who were taking classes. So for the Army, we were able to take a three-week class, shorten it to a two-week class, and they were grading out 60 to 70% higher. So when we did that, it very caught hold of me and said, this is the way to train the younger people. So as I transitioned out of the Army, they asked me to continue to build a better program to teach young people, and I started Visitech USA to be able to do that, and that's what we do today. So you have, have basically applied the, the military high-tech training tools into a K-12 classroom setting. Absolutely, and what we, we did was try to, first is you know you have to filter out all the military stuff, mm -hmm. but you have to get down to how do the students we're trying to engage with, how do they actually comprehend material? How do they like to learn? And I wrote a paper for the Army called Screenagers and said they're basically three screen learners. They learn off of a cell phone, a laptop, and a television. And my th a two and a half year old granddaughter can call me on the phone by herself when she wants to and she has an iPad that she can spin and make do a lot more than I can. So they're a technology savvy generation and that's the way they learn and that's the way they comprehend material. So we built our materials that way. What type of coursework, what type of content, what subject areas have you pr produced virtual learning tools for? Well, we started out with science because that's the most visual that you mm -hmm. can see. So being able to look at one of our computers and take a, a heart out of the computer in the air, put it in your hand and feel the heartbeat, you know, captures the imagination of somebody who's into biology or somebody who wants to be a heart surgeon. Mm -hmm. But we transitioned and we did all the sciences, but then we added math and now we've added an arts program where we can put a 3D ball of clay in there and you can take an electronic pen and shape it or cut it and then you can send it to a 3D printer and it'll print out in plastic. Where we used to make ashtrays, you can now make a plastic ashtray by the same way. You all do it all virtually and then send it to a 3D printer and it'll print it out for you in plastic. So if I'm a high school principal or if I'm a superintendent or a curriculum director and I, I would like to make this kind of tool available to my students, what, what do I need other than, than, than to, to obviously purchase the, the content, but what do I need? Do I need a space? Do I need certain equipment? You really, um, none of our equipment requires any of the internet service. It's all self-contained. So really you just need an electrical plug-in and a table to set the machine on. And other than that, that's, and, and a teacher with imagination, which is the biggest part because they have to look at you know, the programs and be able to take them and build, program, build their, their lesson plans to go wrong with them in a way it will engage the students. Now we help, help the teachers by writing lesson plans and we've got about a thousand lesson plans written for all of the science programs and math programs that are in our machines. But it still requires teachers to have a little imagination and create a little fun. I was in a, a school district in the mountains of North Georgia several weeks ago talking with the school board and they have a very small 100 student K-12 school in a remote area. Mm -hmm. And one of their concerns was, how do we bring career tech ed to these kids when we can't have a, an auto shop or we can't have a, a cosmetology lab or we can't have a, a, a right. you know, some type of other lab? Could you help with that? And, and that's one of the things we excel at because we have, uh, again, with a 24 inch desktop monitor, we can pull a, a, a V8 engine out in the air and then with an electronic pen, you can take the spark plugs out of it or you can take the oil pan off and you can show them how the valves work or a diesel engine. And uh, it was, it was when we had built the diesel engine, I didn't know this, but a diesel engine's got 800 parts in it. I mean, it's a lot of moving things inside of a diesel engine, but it gives them the capacity to be able to put that engine out here in front of them. And then when you turn the machine off, it disappears. So it does away with the cost of having to buy those engines, have them sitting there, have all the equipment it takes to move them around and a place to store them and all the damage that can be done while students are learning on them. It's all done virtually, so they lose all that expense and they can put the technology that they're asking for on a table for the students to use. It's probably a lot safer than the old wood shop that I worked in. A lot safer, a lot safer. You don't drop anything on your toes, you don't get anything in your eyes, it's a lot safer to do that. So. Well, if I'm a kid, I'm sure you've seen kids when, when you rolled out this program into a school as, as a first blush appearance of it. And if I'm a kid and, and, and I'm starting to participate in this, what kind of reactions do you see from the young people? 
Well, you know, it, it's pretty amazing sometimes. We, uh, we get a little overwhelmed with the students when they, they see this and you hear them just take an audible gasp. Mm -hmm. You hear them go, and because they've never been able to see something like that come out of the screen out. And we've had teachers and students both that have written us some great letters saying, I, I've always been taught biology, but I never really understood this until I saw it this way. And we, we've had teachers that have written us saying, thank you because now I can teach a concept to a student that I never could get across to them before because I can put it in the air in front of them and they can see it. And, and one of the things I mean by that is we take, for instance, figuring the surface area of a cylinder. That's a hard concept for a sixth grader because they look at that round surface and you know they're trying to figure out all that surface area. So what we teach them to do is take the two circles off and then figure, you know, pi r squared, figure the radius of that and they can figure the surface area of that. But then that tube is still there and that, cur that curved area always bothers them. So in the air, we can take that cylinder and we take it and unfold it into just a rectangle. And then it's just height times width and that gives them the surface area. And when you see that, when they do that, and they see that thing unfold, you'll see them go, oh, I got it. And when they do that, that's what makes it worthwhile to do this work because they get it. Stuart, we're here at the National Dropout Prevention Center's at-risk youth forum. We try to do dropout prevention. You're doing high-tech instructional devices and tools. What's the connection? Well, you know, your team knows tremendously more than we do about all the problems students face that cause them to drop out. What we focus on is, if a student is in school, how do we keep them there? And what we help them understand is how not to have to worry about swapping time for a, a small job, mm -hmm. you know, time for dollars. Mm -hmm. What we show them how to do is swap their time for their dreams, mm -hmm. whatever their dream is. If they put the time into it to learn it, they can reach their dreams and they don't have to worry about you know, putting time in just to learn to be able to work at a fast food restaurant or on an assembly line. They can put the time in and then go learn how to design the assembly line or own the fast food restaurant by, by doing those things. So we, what we focus on is when, you, when, they, when they go to school, we focus on engaging them to the point that they understand that an education is their key to their dreams. And that's what we focus on is trying to get them to that point. Fantastic. Stuart, thank you for sharing us with us. Well, it's a fantastic concept. Same here. And thank you for letting us be a part of it again. We appreciate the partnership. Certainly. Thank you. Wow, if that isn't 21st century, I don't know what is. There are things going on out there. Uh, what a wonderful partner, uh, innovative partner for the National Dropout Prevention Center and Network. And uh, I'm so glad that that interview was brought to our attention today to see what really neat things are going on out there. This Talk is terrific. Talk about engaging. Talk about engaging. <laughs> so um, we've got some another interview that's coming up, our final one today. Yes, in the next segment, Dr. Addis, talked with uh, Dean George Peterson, who's the founding dean of the Eugene T. Moore School of Education at Clemson University. The School of Education, well now the College of Education, yeah. is home to the National Dropout Prevention Center Network. And they prepare teachers, principals, school leadership, um, and uh, all the workers in the personnel in the schools to uh, be ready for this 21st century. Mm. Um, Dr. Addis talked with Dean Peterson and asked him at the beginning, what brought you to Clemson? Dean Peterson, you've been at Clemson University a little over 18 months now. Yes. What, what drew you to Clemson University? Well, candidly, uh, several things. Uh, first of all, Clemson as an institution, as a land-grant institution, and its work to um, enhance the quality of life of citizens in South Carolina uh, is is a, draw, a large drawing card. Uh, the other aspect of it in thinking about my role as founding dean were many of the programs and centers housed within the College of Education or School of Education and one of those of course being the National Dropout mm -hmm. Prevention Center. And we all know that uh, that work is systemic to the success of all of the schools in the country, uh, specifically underserved populations uh, as a young man who came, my mom was a migrant farm worker, and having to go through school uh, wasn't a straight, narrow path for us. Um, I really respect this work and understand the value of this work. So the mission of the School of Education, uh, the brand of Clemson, and the power of, of the brand of Clemson, as well as the high quality work 
that the centers and the faculty of Clemson actually uh, are engaged with were all significant drawing cards for me. Dean Peterson, uh, the School of Education at Clemson University is a major provider of educator workforce in South Carolina. Uh, I know there are numerous programs in the, the School of Education. Could you give us an overview of what those are? Well, absolutely. First and foremost, uh, the National Dropout Center. So <laughs> Thank you. the work that the National Dropout Center is uh, critical, and I've seen it under your leadership. I've actually seen it really begin to come into its own. I see working with the board uh, has been a significant uh, in, uh, enhancement of, the, of that work and, and getting a larger and larger footprint. We have, we have excellent programs like the Call Me Mister program mm -hmm. that looks at African American young men and getting them back into uh, elementary schools uh, to work with underserved populations. We have uh, Reading Recovery which helps children in first grade get to reading uh, at grade level, which is critical for their academic success. We have Clemson Life, which is a different program, but working with uh, young people who, who are uh, mentally challenged mm -hmm. and bringing them and giving them a, a, a college experience. Uh, and we have, uh, we have other programs uh, that are affiliated with like Emerging Scholars, and we have a strong STEAM initiative that actually looks at enhancing the capacity of elementary school teachers and middle school teachers in the area of teaching STEM and uh, so that they're able to better prepare their students for a STEM or uh, type, type of opportunity to take those types of courses in college so that they'll be uh, competitive in the workforce. A aside from some of the excellent work we have in e educational leadership working with principals and of course then we have a significant amount of research done by our faculty many of which have won national awards for, the, for its uh, impact and quality. Mm -hmm. Dean Peterson, uh, Clemson turns out a lot of educators. They're, 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 they're all across the, the state of South Carolina, across the country in, in school systems, uh, in, in, in various roles. Uh, what do you see is, is, is over the next five years, your goal for, for the School of Education in providing that educator workforce? What do you want them to be and be able to do? Well, candidly, I think the idea is that as, uh, as the School of Education becomes, um, in July we become a college, so I'm very thrilled about that. I think uh, some of the work that we've really uh, began to target in on, again, is this idea of working with uh, our folks in business so that we are more tightly aligned with the needs of the business community, understanding that our teachers, our counselors, our leaders, mm -hmm prepare and work with those families and those young people. A greater emphasis and a greater work with underserved populations and, and becoming, um, uh, becoming more engaged with those schools uh, in the upstate but also down in the uh, other aspects and other areas of, of the state itself. Uh, some of the other goals I, we have for us is to uh, think about our work in collaboration with other institutes institutions of higher education, either locally or nationally, uh, creating various um, national uh, programs that would, uh, would address some very complicated issues, again, underserved populations and areas of na dropout or underserved populations. And then I think the other point for us is to, uh, to be seen as, a, as the leader in South Carolina to, as uh, teacher preparation, but also in, uh, in preparing that next generation of counselors and leaders. And then uh, um, I, I think that the, our largest uh, challenge and goal is to really begin to influence policy around education and the quality of education that occurs. That's a little bit more of a long-term goal, but those are goals that we have in the school. Dean Peterson, you mentioned several times underserved communities, underserved uh, school systems. Um, can you tell us what it would look like and what, what it's looking like as Clemson reaches out to those underserved school systems? What are we doing to help those folks? Well, you know, it's a very complicated issue, as you know. Um, and I think for us, one of the things we've really began to understand is the idea that uh, working with communities in more of an ecosystem. So sometimes uh, education sees itself as coming in and delivering a body of work or a body of experience and then uh, hoping that it resonates and stays. 
uh, the work that we're doing and the research has talked about, you have to, it's kind of like a, a, it's like a triangle. So you have the students, you have the community and the families, but then you have to bring in the business aspect. Mm -hmm. So the idea of collaboration across those three areas, collaborating with the students and the teachers, but bringing in the family, because the capacity of the family is critical for the success of the students. And then the business community has a vested interest in the success of all children because that's the next phase of workforce, either entrepreneurs or technical schools or university settings. Um, so for us in the School of Education, we began to think of it as an ecosystem and creating an ecosystem that involves all three aspects in order to strengthen and sustain any type of initiative or any type of program in a, in a community that, you know, historically or economically has not had these uh, services and their, these abilities. So um, we have to think of it broadly uh, because uh, of a, a myriad of issues. And I think the thought, a process about bringing in business into the conversation of not only just sponsoring but also working because uh, some of the work that needs to be done in schools needs to be product based and needs to be uh, engaged. The curriculum needs to engage in thinking skills and communication skills and some of the soft skills and business would lend itself to that and then of course the capacity at home you have parents who uh, may have multiple jobs or single parent families uh, their capacity in aiding them in helping their children be able to matriculate through mm -hmm. is, is critical for that success as well and in these communities um, a lot of times that doesn't exist so working more thoughtfully and more strategically in that area. Dean Peterson, the National Dropout Prevention Center has been <coughs> at Clemson University for almost 30 years. Uh, how could you see going forward the National Dropout Prevention Center contributing to the mission of the School of Education? Well, I, I, I don't have to look very far because I think that it's already doing that. I mean, I think about the work of the National Dropout Center and its focus on underserved schools and at-risk populations, um, the, uh, the notion of addressing the schools, the leaders, the families, and being able to give them the appropriate tools so that their children and their schools are successful in their kids matriculating through, um, that, is, that is in line, parallels all of the work that we currently want to do in the School of Education and as a land-grant institution of Clemson, I think it's there. Um, Again, as I said at the outset, I think one of the things that you're doing under your leadership and with the board and, and with your staff is gaining a larger footprint. Mm -hmm. And I think that that larger footprint speaks volumes about the importance of the work. And I see this uh, relationship of bringing with faculty and programs and other areas to be, um, to be complementary and productive. Thank you, Dean Peterson. We're, we're pleased that the footprint of the National Dropout Prevention Center looks a lot like a tiger paw. <laughs> and we, we really value what, what the support that you've provided and that Clemson University provides yeah. for our efforts. We've been real fortunate to have Dean George Peterson here with us this morning in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Thank you. It's really great to be aligned with such a dean. I um, mean, my goodness, he's so forward thinking in the colleges and we're part of it. And Dr. Peterson is also on the board of the National Dropout Prevention Network, so he is a true supporter of dropout prevention. Yes, he is, Marty. We're very lucky to have him as our dean and, and leader. He's yeah, and we're glad to share him with our him. audience today, so <laughs> exactly. you know how lucky we are to have him here mm -hmm. at Clemson University. And so, well, let's see, we're moving toward the end of our program today. We want to remind our viewers about some of the uh, services of the National Drop-On Prevention Center Network? Yes, we definitely do. Um, our guests, our segments that today were all filmed on location at different conferences. Um, we have several conferences a year, five, four or five a year. Uh, viewers can always go to our website, www.dropoutprevention.org and go to the conferences page to see what's coming up. Conferences, workshops, those kind of things are always posted on there. Um, we also, as, as 
if you're on the website, look around at all the resources that are there related to dropout prevention mm -hmm. strategies, oh, yeah. risk factors, um, and and actual things you can do. Plus, these uh, all of our solutions webcasts are yep. posted there. They're all archived. there. And this particular one, if you had something you wanted to give us some feedback or you want to start a conversation, we have a discussion board. Right, right. We have a discussion board related, uh, connected to mm -hmm. each of the webcasts. So if there's mm -hmm. a topic of interest and you'd like to get a conversation going, you can use the uh, discus discussion board mm -hmm. on the webcast page. Mm -hmm. We also have Twitter at NDPCN, mm -hmm. and we have Facebook, That's and right. email, of course. Anyone That's right. can email yep. us. and Always we, there for you. There Always for there for you, everybody. Mm -hmm. We are. Well, um, next month, we will be getting back, rolling up our sleeves, and doing some professional development uh, with uh, great resources on each particular topic. And I think next month on resilience and data collection, we won't say any more, but this one is going to be a great show with uh, Leanne Stewart. So we want to encourage you to put that on your calendar and look forward to August. And I think our final thoughts are to be thankful to our sponsor. K-12 and Fuel Education have supported us on this program and we appreciate them so we can bring this to you. So any final thoughts, Karen? I am delighted to do this and, and um, and try to get some information out there for to help people. And so, yeah. so we look great. forward to seeing you again, seeing you again, and mm -hmm. seeing all of you again here on Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. See you next month.